views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. Claudette brings fresh, innovative perspectives that push the boundaries of what organizational cultures can and should be. Learn how to catalyze your organization's workforce into an authentic, intentional, and financially successful culture. Now here's your host, Claudette Rowley. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Pat, and I am here with Claudette Rowley. She is uh, the host of fabulous show, Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence. And right here on Transformation Talk Radio, the conscious business radio station, and on the Dr. Pat Show Network Worldwide. You know, Claudette has been in the world. You know, she is the CEO of Cultural Brilliance. That is a cultural design consulting company. Over 20 years experience in organizational development. And what she's discovered in that point in time, you're going to be able to find on her website, culturalbrilliance.com. But today, what we're talking about is U.S. culture, the cultural brilliance perspective. What is it in the United States with this upcoming presidential election? Culture in the United States is being called into question in an unpre- in unprecedented ways. It, it's so much so, there's not a phone conversation I have. It doesn't matter whether it's with our clients here, whether it's with my relatives, where there is a light bulb that goes on that we just have not been educated and informed about. Well, today, Claudette is going to shine that cultural brilliance light on ways to explore U.S. culture through the lens of cultural brilliance. What would a brilliant culture look like for us? Claudette, great to have you here. This is a great topic. Tell tell us a little bit about how this topic, this idea came to you. Tell us a little bit about what has been on your mind about this. Thanks, Pat. It's great to be here. What's been on my mind has been as as I've developed cultural brilliance over the last couple of years, really starting to look at how do we, what's going on in all sorts of cultures, not just organizational cultures, and that's really important, and what's going on in community cultures, what's going on in in subcultures within our country and around the world, and then with our presidential election right around the corner, Mm -hmm. that, you know, that it, it brings up so much about culture. You know, we're seeing two different versions and visions of of a potential culture for our company, our country, excuse me. Mm-hmm. We're seeing all sorts of subcultures that have, from my perspective, been a little bit beneath the surface, really coming up and saying, coming up to be recognized, coming up to be discussed. So it's a time where culture just seems to be on everybody's mind. It is. And I love what you said. You know, some folks have called it the multi-million person elephant that has been in the room. Mm. Um, You know, in a conversation I had this week, many conversations, what I've discovered is, uh, and I can't speak for everyone, but I can only speak for a contingency of women that I've, I've talked with. There is a light bulb that hasn't got on and it has to do with culture. It's, you know, in conversations, you say things and folks look at you. I had so one, one woman who I've known for a while say to me, Pat, you're wrong on this. I know you're right on a lot of things, but you got to be absolutely wrong. And I said, well, go ahead and Google it and let me know what you find. So part of this, I want to ask you what role, and I say this respectfully, what role does ignorance play? Because I got to tell you, for me, ignorance has helped me most of my life, meaning the idea of I don't know what I don't know. And so applying to a graduate in a doctoral program when on paper that was never going to happen, I did it anyway. But do you know what I mean about that word ignorance? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The not knowing. What role does that play? Well, that's a really interesting question. Mm-hmm. And what's coming up for me is sometimes and I'm going to speak very generally, just sometimes yeah. as human beings, we we may not even, first of all, know that we're, we're we don't even know what we don't know sometimes. Yeah. We sometimes also find ourselves 
thinking, I kind of don't want to know much about this because if I know a lot about it, I may then have to face it. And if I face it, I may then need to make choices about it or do something about it. So we all live within our own worlds, right? In our own sub cultures within our families and our, our, our close communities. So I think a part of the role of ignorance is that not everybody knows what they don't know. And some people really are hoping that, that some of the things that are going on aren't really true. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that, that leads me to talk with you about, you know, one of the uh, parts of the cultural brilliance model that you've created and it is such an important part. We could probably, and we have done a whole show on it, but in today's uh, context of talking about culture, let us talk about, if we could, culture in the United States, authenticity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So authenticity in the U.S., I mean, and I, the cultural brilliance model, which is really, a, it's a, it's a three-part process with where we look at the authenticity of a culture, and then we talk about how to design the change and integrate the change. With the authenticity piece, we can apply that lens to really any culture, organizational, you know, a country, a community, the U.S. And so the premise behind the authenticity piece is that we're looking at what is what's the truth about a particular culture. Mm. And there be maybe 20 different truths if we talk to 20 <laughs> different people. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at what what are the what are the norms that we know about and what are those underlying norms or underlying assumptions that we may not know much about, or maybe we know, but nobody really talks about, maybe it's the elephant in the room. And so with, with U.S. culture, if one of the things we'd be looking at, I think this is true of most countries, yeah. is we'd be looking at a set of subcultures too, right? Right. So if exactly. we pull, pull a lot of the subcultures into one room, right, representatives of all these, you know, maybe hundreds of different subcultures into a room, it would be a fascinating discussion about what they viewed the mm -hmm. authenticity of our culture to be. And we might find that there would be a, you know, a place where almost every subculture overlapped, that there was something that was really important to them. And it could be something like we want our families to be safe and taken care of, yeah. right? So, something basic like that. We want to be successful as people and be able to thrive as citizens of this country. Um, so there might be, you know, there, there most likely would be some core overlapping principles, beliefs, and assumptions that everyone really valued and held true. And then I would imagine, right, that there would, within all these different subcultures, that there would be then a really big variety about what was important to them. Mm -hmm. And all of yeah. that would be authentic. Yeah. I, you know what I love about what we're talking about is, you know, cultural brilliance or the brilliance model that you're talking about right now, the brilliance model you're talking about right now is the one where we can look at attributes that, that would get us to that place and attributes that won't. I mean, we got to look at both, don't we? I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. like, let's look at all being positive and doing this and doing that. We can also learn from some of the characteristics we're seeing mm -hmm. in our political uh, election right now. Uh, authenticity is really striking to me because I don't remember, maybe, maybe it's just my memory, but I don't remember an election where we had to have fact checkers. <laughs> I mean, do you? I mean... I, 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 I never heard that we have to have an entire organization that is doing nothing but checking facts. Yeah. I mean, and that speaks to perhaps a cultural change, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. <laughs> and, and I think with the authenticity, right. Authenticity is not just looking at what, what's good and works well, mm -hmm. um, what's positive and works well. I mean, authenticity is literally saying, what is the truth? Even if there are 20 different truths, right. But what is the truth mm -hmm. of what's going on? And that might be some things that are amazing and phenomenal and they're going to be, and this would be true in an organization as well. And then it'd be saying in, in some organizations, at least, you know, what are the mm -hmm. things that are really not working well? Like maybe, you know, something that's authentic um, for U.S. culture might be the way mm -hmm. you know, certain people are facing discrimination. That's authentic and true in our cu culture right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessarily something many of us would agree is a good thing to keep. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, let's talk about authenticity and a couple of other things that you've just mentioned. How has, from your point of view, using this model, what have you, see, what have you seen uh, in, in our culture in the U.S.? What are some of the obvious things that you see have, that have changed and that are coming to the forefront? Mm -hmm. uh, positives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some things that really strike me are things like uh, gay marriage becoming more commonplace. 
right? <laughs> right. Decades and decades and decades of struggle there. Um, I, you know, I've, I have kids in middle school and high school and talking to them about, so are, are there kids in your school that are, are in same sex relationships? And what's mm-hmm. that like? They're like, yeah, well, of course, of course there are. Like, of, what do you mean? What's it like? I mean, that's just, that's what they do. Like, it's so not a big deal. It's just part of life. And that is a really big change, a generational change. Um, that's one thing I'm seeing. Uh, so we, and then we see, I also am seeing some real, the right, you know, this discussion now about rape culture, black uh-huh. lives matter. And we see and like, all this has been, we knew about it. It's been bubbling underneath the surface. Mm-hmm. And then we see groups of people coming up and saying, this is not acceptable anymore. This has got to change. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I'll tell you what I'm really yeah. struck by, and I don't really know what to make of it. You know, um, I personally have never uh, been prevented from going and, and voting. You know, that's not the demographic I represent, you know, and I have to tell you, I, I can only imagine what would happen in that voting office if somebody ever tried to get in front of me voting. So that's another story. But I come from a blended family. Um, I am probably on the minority side of my family in that. Well, I don't think I'm on the minority side, but I'm going to say that we have a multi uh, generational family that have both uh, African-American in our family. We have South Americans in our family by the droves. We have Dominican Republics in my fam- Republicans in my family. So we have Latinos. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my niece's daughter was ahead of the Latino group at NYU. So we have these. And I want to tell you, voting is fearful for folks. Mm-hmm. It's fe- it really is. And that is a culture change that I hear has happened before. That's a big culture change that I just didn't think would happen in my lifetime, Claudette. I, I don't know. Am I living under a rock? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, again, it's, it's, it's an interesting example and a sad example of some of the things that nobody's been talking about for a long time. And now they're surfacing to say, wow, we're fearful about voting. This actually needs to change. It's not, not acceptable. We're all citizens. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't be concerned about voting. Mm. We should just go vote. Right. Well, here's what we're going to talk about when we come back. You know, when you take a look at everything that has shown up and we're looking at it in the model of cultural brilliance, what is the cultural design in the U.S. today? We touched upon it a little bit, but what actually is that? What does that mean from Claudette Rowley's point of view? You're tuning into Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley and with me, Dr. Pat. When we come back, we're going to be digging deeply into this design question. Because some people would say, nah, don't really have a design. Nah, not Claudette. We'll be right back. Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Are you sick of feeling overworked with no motivation? Take a break from the daily grind. Life coach Nicole Eisler is here to provide a healing journey of optimism. Passionate and caring, Nicole is no ordinary soul. Her dedication to helping everyone has no limit. Witness the power of positivity. Tune in every first and third Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific for Positivity Party Radio with Nicole Eisler on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit BigDreamAwakening.com. What is a brilliant culture? And how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence, and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com.
Hi, this is Leslie Fontaine, and my show is Sheer Alchemy on TransformationTalkRadio.com. When we're bogged down with our emotions, the hardships that plague us in our relationships, at work, our finances, we literally can't see the higher plane where we could be operating from. Tune in to Leslie Fontaine, Sheer Alchemy on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Get ready to experience Truth Talk Radio with host Deb Acker. Tune in to Truth Talk Radio each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com to illuminate the truth in your daily life as you experience life, love, and abundance from a whole new perspective. This hit show will leave you feeling lighter and bring you into a place of infinite possibilities every day in every way. Visit TruthTalkRadioShow.com for upcoming transformative topics and guests. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Time. Talk Radio. Wow, welcome back, everyone. Claudette, before we jump back into this, I, I want to just um, have you talk a little bit about uh, how people can find out more about you. And you have a newsletter. Tell them about that, what you send out to folks. Uh, and also your blog. And then we'll jump right into cultural design in the U.S. Thanks, Pat. So my website is culturalbrilliance.com. And I do on on uh, on Monday mornings or sometime during the day on Monday, I send out a really short email. It's called Leadership Mindset. And it's just it's a thought provoking question or idea just to help you get your, your week started in an intellectually stimulating way. And sometimes people will share with me, you know, I got I got your leadership mindset and it was exactly what I needed to hear. Or it asked me a question that got me, you know, thinking about a problem I needed to solve. So that's the intent of it. Um, and then I do have a blog. I have a great and very extensive blog on my website. And that has a lot of interesting information and perspectives. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. And uh, and lots more to come, too. I also want to mention uh, that folks that want to work with you directly, you work with organizations. That is also a way for them to find out more about you. You also speak, keynote speaking and other things. So lot, lots to talk with uh, Claudette about um, cultural design in the U.S. I know I've heard it and I'm sure you've heard it. People say we don't really have design. And, and mm -hmm. then my answer is, well, that by the very nature of what you just said, that is a design. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, this is this is your area of expertise. Um, where do you even begin? Where do you start with cultural design in the U.S.? That's such a yeah. It's, it's a fascinating thing <laughs> to think about, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. And so you're right. I mean, we there's always there's neither intentional design or there's an unconscious design that just evolves. And again, we can liken this to what happens in organizations, which all have cultures that you can be conscious and intentional about the culture you'd like your organization to have. And if you're not, it will just form. And it may form in a way that works really well, you know, if you're lucky, or it may form in a way that doesn't work so well after a while. Uh, and, and like any culture, there are going to be parts that are positive and um, life-affirming and parts that may may not be so much and may hold hold a group of people back from succeeding in the way they want to. And I think on a very, of course, very, very grand scale, when we look at U.S. culture, um, it seems like the design is kind of all over the place right now, you know, in the sense that we have so many differences of opinion. You know, we have our we have our government and our certain structures in place. We have different um, moral codes that most of us live by. Uh, we have laws. And then within all of that, the cultural design seems to vary so much, again, depending where you are. Yeah. Uh, what part of the country are you in? In certain neighborhoods, where are you in the socioeconomic level, um, ethnic culture, all of that. So it it seems to me that when we think about, when I think about design for organizations, one of the things I'm looking at is, okay, where is the culture now? We've, you know, we've gone through a process of understanding what's authentic about it, what's working well, what, what might need to change. And then we move into a process of designing that, you know, which is essentially about how do we move the culture from where it is right now in, in present moment 
to where it would like to be and how does it functionally move, but also how does it emotionally move forward? Um, and I think especially in our the U.S. culture and country right now, there's something about the emotional design of the culture uh, that I see really getting in the way. And an example of that would be people who for whom someone believing something different than they believe it mm-hmm. is unacceptable suddenly. When we, we really, I feel like, lived in a culture where people didn't agree, but you could have some differences and that was, you know, people would just agree to disagree. Yeah. It was a little bit softer, you know, it was a little bit softer. And now it's much more of, you know, if I have a belief and you have an, a, belief, a belief and we aren't on the same page, then I don't even know if we can associate with each other. Yeah, that's right. And so that, that's an interesting design in the culture right now. And I keep thinking about, well, what if what if we were to come back to a new version of let's be conscious and intentional and understand that, of course, in any healthy culture, country culture, organizational culture, you are going to have differences. And that can be so life affirming and generative because it's going to lead to new ideas, new perspectives and new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, here's the design I want to talk about. We think we live in the land of the free right? The home of the brave. So here's an article I'm writing. This is shocking when you think about it. If in fact, uh, Hillary Clinton does get elected, just say if she does, she'll be the first president in the history of this country that's elected without equal rights. That's a design issue. Now, mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm sure people listen, may listen to this and you may be thinking that's a whole lot of issues. But <laughs> isn't that a design issue? Right. It's it's part of the design because we've gone through, you know, equality at many, many levels. Right. And you just you alluded to this earlier when, uh, you know, uh, same sex marriages. Right. Were were the talk of the town. Nobody's talking about it now. Right. I mean, there certainly is a couple of states. But it's really not the buzz it used to be. That's a culture design change, right? But we have not been able to get equal meaning equal here. And yet Hollywood has come out and they've said, we're not getting equal pay. And you know what people say? Too bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that is a design, though. It, and we can change design, can't we? I, I- I believe we can absolutely mm-hmm. change design. I mean, we have to start back at authenticity to understand what's really going on, right? In terms of the the what are the norms and assumptions that are operating, and then absolutely once we have a, an understanding of that, and people are willing to at least maybe not agree, but accept that some of these things are true, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of equal rights, yeah. Then we move in. The design can absolutely be changed. And I think that's a lot of what the conversations around mm-hmm. equal rights are right now. Like this yeah. needs to change. Mm-hmm. This needs What's to change. What's a cultural brilliant design? Because that's really where, you know, the, that's really where the, the goal is for us to really mm-hmm. look at what that looks like. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the way you work with organizations as well. Yeah. So cultural. So the definition, one definition of cultural brilliance or brilliant cultures is that they are responsive to the needs of the people, their people, their systems, and then the external environment. So there's this level of responsiveness back and forth between inside of the culture and outside of the culture that they, they inform each other and it's symbiotic in a way. And so when I think about a brilliant culture, brilliant design for something like the, the equality piece, it would be, it would be the recognition that is, human beings just because we're different genders doesn't mean we don't have Mm -hmm. exactly the same rights and 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 distilling it down and and then also taking it a step further so if we all had the same rights then what would be possible Mm -hmm. how how would that inform our design what would we Mm -hmm. be doing differently what's the mindset we need to incorporate and and Mm -hmm. adopt that kind of design because mm-hmm. what we do know is that I'm for whatever reason I'm remind I grew up in Michigan and I'm reminded of um, yeah when I was growing up found out that there was I think it was until the late eight somewhere in the 1980s in Michigan the state legislature still had a law in the books saying that a man could rape his wife and it was legal yes now he couldn't yeah. rape someone that wasn't his wife that was illegal but if mm-hmm. it, if they were married that was okay until the, somewhere in the 1980s which astonished me even then. Mm. Uh, and the Equal Rights Amendment that hasn't been passed. So there's still something in our culture 
that is bucking this idea of inequality. Yeah. And do you know what I found out here in a short period of time? And and we're trying we have an article that's coming out about it as well. I've tried to call every news media station, every one of them. I got some kind of voicemail. I, I'm telling you, I have never seen anything like this. Mm-hmm. You know, because what we're talking about is a design. If we want to look at media, if if somebody called me about something they had a, important to say, I'm picking up the phone. And maybe if it's not me, it's Jessica, or somebody else here. I mean, you work with this team here, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if you had something to report, unless it was going to be something that is sensationalized, weird stuff, right? Mm hmm. You don't get a call back. I mean, I've tried Anderson Cooper. I've tried Rachel Maddow. I mean, I guarantee you if I tried Fox, I might get something because they would twist what I was about to say here. And and, you know, there are both sides. They wouldn't twist it. They would present the side that is based on their design. And everybody in this country, don't you think, has a right to do that? See, that's the right we have, isn't it, in our design? Well, it is the right we have. And I keep I was thinking about the situation in Standing Rock. Oh. And uh, and wh- how that could be how that could be redesigned mm. it could so be redesigned. T- can you tell me more about that? Yeah. I mean, just looking at, for example, um, you know, we have the pipeline in our country, you know, mm-hmm. the government. Right. And then we have our uh, and then we have the people who are protesting Native Americans, environmental activists and all the other people who are concerned at this point. And just thinking about redesigns like. You know, redesigns like what if we had a different kind of dialogue? What if people and this may sound simplistic, but it's known to work. What if representatives from all parties sat down and actually listened to each other's concerns? Mm. That would be a redesign. And mm-hmm. then what would happen if they heard each other's concerns, they heard each other's desires, wants, what they wanted to have happen? Would it be possible for a solution to be reached that everyone could at least live with, right? Mm-hmm. And so a redesign would be, let's listen. A redesign would be, let's have some sort of, you know, negotiation or mediation. A redesign would be, you know, how do we actually want to handle this tough situation in a way that perhaps doesn't have anything to do with violence? Mm-hmm. That's really yeah. what the conversation is about. Mm-hmm. You know, how do we come to the table? And I've heard you talk about this so often. How do we come to the table and listen to understand when we come back? We're going to be talking about cultural integration in the United States. That's not exactly what you think it means when we come back. Claudette's going to take us on a journey about how we put this all together and what does it look like under the cultural brilliance model? Take a break, everybody. We'll be right back. Join in on one of the most life-transforming adventures in personal expansion and world service. In each of our upcoming shows, you're going to have the opportunity to join thousands as we focus healing energy to elevate and balance our world. This is a chance for like-minded individuals like you and I to join forces with light workers all over the globe as we light the way for peace, harmony, and a world driven by love. You'll also learn about magical innate abilities that you can develop and use to make your dreams come true. Joy Elaine, author of The Joy Chronicles, invites you to join her and millions of others working with the Galactic Masters, Angels, and the Ashtar Command as they assist humanity and planet Earth to achieve their ultimate destination of ascension. For more information, visit joyelaine.com. That's joy, E-L-A-I-N-E, dot com. What is a brilliant culture? And how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com. 
Tune in to the Angels and Answers Psychic Radio Show with Claire Florence, Artie Hoffman, and Sky Siegel every Thursday for a two-hour show, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Transformation Talk Radio. Artie and Sky deliver spiritual and motivational messages with passion and a sense of humor. Call in 800-930-2819 for live and on-air readings. Visit ArtieHoffman.com and SkyOfAngels.com. Beyond being this amazing neurologist, inventor, author, Dr. Dan Cohen has been called to look at technology and look at personal and spiritual development and merge these together as technology uses the healing and psycho-spiritual effects of synchronized sounds, vibrations, electromagnetic fields, and how that interacts with us in our nervous system in what we're calling the Soltech Chair. The Soltech Lounge induces profound levels of relaxation that transition over time into deep meditative states. The synchronized sound vibration and magnetic field induce these states. The subject doesn't have to work at it. To learn more, go to soltechwellbeing.com. That's S-O-L-T-E-C, well-being. Oh, my gosh. Wow. What a great show. Uh, Claudette Rowley is uh, in the house here. This is Cultural Brilliance Radio and U.S. Cultures, the Cultural Brilliance Perspective, really opens up the door of possibilities. What could be? You know, and we see a lot of this dialogue in the U.N., don't we, uh, Claudette, right? I mean, when I think about the U.N., and I've, I've been in front of the U.N. a couple of times, not doing anything special, but there to support my friends. And, uh, you, you know, we see this kind of dialogue that gets to have a presence there. We do not see this dialogue in mainstream media. And so when I, when I see this and the conversation now is about cultural integration in the United States, many people listen and say, ah, oh, you know, we've talked about that before. No, that's not what we're talking about here, is it? No, 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 it's not. No, it's not. It's really about how do we integrate cultural changes so how do we, you know, if we if we understand how a culture is authentic and we design what we, you know, what the parts we want to keep and the parts we want to change and we design how functionally and emotionally a culture will move from where it is to where it's going to be, where it wants to be, and needs to be, then we have the integration piece is essentially the implementation piece. How are we going to bring this to life and make it real? And mm-hmm. In other words, there's no point in creating a design if we're not going to do something with it. Uh, so that's more the nuts and bolts part of it is how do we literally integrate, right? Internalize, uh, make it part of us. Mm -hmm. And and there's um, certainly a practical uh, planning, planning piece to that communication Mm -hmm. piece to that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, when I think about this, I do think about the UN. Mm -hmm. I really do. You know, there's a lot of people that look at the UN and they laugh, UN, but think about it. Think about what happens in that arena, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how, Many people say, well, they don't have a lot of power. Oh, my gosh. Everybody knows UN, right? Everybody mm-hmm. knows it. Uh, let's say not everybody knows it. But when you hear about it, you have a sense of it, right? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, I'm now, okay, blah, blah, went to the UN. I don't really know what's going to go on there. We have a sense of authentically what's going to happen there. We know what their design is. And we know they represent a forum where many ideas have a place to come and be integrated and shared, right? I mean, isn't that one version maybe of a, 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 a cultural brilliance model for this? I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that can be one version. I think part of the integration piece is, or implementation piece is, yeah, you can integrate ideas and discuss them, but it this is also the aspect of it where it physically or functionally create or emotionally creates a change. Mm -hmm. You know, it sets this change in place. We were doing it this one way and now we're going to be doing it another way. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've actually made that particular change. So as an organization, you know, we've decided that we need a culture that's far more um, innovative because we've gotten kind of stuck in a little stodgy and in order to maintain our competitive edge, 
Ellen actually to have more fun, right? We mm-hmm. need to we need to innovate more. And so over time, this or, a particular organization is going to design how that's going to happen, and then actually implement it, and start to see it come to fruition within their culture and their organization. Yeah, that's another that's another way to to look at it. I think. Well, t- it tell us yeah. more about that because I think what you're talking about here is something that's all over the headlines right now. You know, we're talking about cultures and subcultures right now in the United States. And many people think, oh, that's just in the United States. But I got to tell you, the ripple effect of that dialogue in politics has hit every corporation, every business, all of it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that our election, the dialogues around the election, um, a lot of the cultural issues that are, quote, up, you know, in our country right now Mm -hmm. are feel, I think for many people are experiencing them as chaotic. Mm -hmm. It feels chaotic. It feels like there's going to be a lot of change. It feels Mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, we don't know, of course, which way the election's really, really going to go. It's -hmm. unclear, right? Yep. And then something's going to happen, you know, after we know who our new president is. So I think there's a lot of chaos and change going on for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it. I mean, you know, we touched upon this earlier with, you know, I was tell- I was saying that never in my history of voting so far has anybody tried to block me from going in uh, to vote. But I will tell you that my cousins, my, you know, my relatives and, you know, that are in states like Georgia, in states like the Carolinas uh, and are uh, we have a multi ethnic uh, family history. Uh, Latino, African American, you name it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very, this is very real for them. Oh yeah. You know, the, yeah. The good news is there's nobody going to get in their way either. Right. But they're not the norm, right? <laughs> right. They're, yeah. they're not the norm, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think we also know integration or implementation is happening when we start to see, we start to see the positive impacts of a particular change within a culture. Mm-hmm. So, example in the U.S. could be people starting to actually ask themselves which is, this is one of my dreams. Yeah. Know, what are my blind spots about other people? Yes. What are my beliefs about myself and other people and our differences actually get in the way of me seeing this person as simply another human being? Mm-hmm. You know, how do I, how do I move out of somehow this victim energy I've gotten stuck in as mm-hmm. opposed to realizing I'm a human being. So I am empowered to make choices. You know, mm-hmm. how do we start to heal our rifts and so that we start to see each other as equal members of humanity? Well, let's talk about that, because part of this is looking afterwards Mm -hmm. and afterwards. What we're looking at is how do we heal this, Mm -hmm. you know, and how we how do we heal this using the cultural brilliance model? Because I'll tell you, there will be healing to be done. It doesn't matter from what perspective or who wins or who loses. There is a healing. I guess the question that I'm asking is, um, are people going to want to heal or are they just going to want to be angry? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I don't, I don't know. I'm not hearing people wanting to heal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I I think, I think there, yeah, I think, I think it's depends who you're speaking with. I mean, I hear people who are really concerned about the healing aspect of things um, because they don't want chaos. They don't want war. They don't want a lot of negative things to happen. They don't want certain groups of people in our country to be even more marginalized than they already are. Um, they don't want people to starve. So uh, there's there's that, that aspect. And then I yeah. And then there are people who are just really, really angry. And I think not speaking for them, of course, my sense of right. it is that for some of them, they've been angry for so long and often for very legitimate reasons oh, yeah. that yeah. They're, it seems like their anger has nowhere to go because it hasn't been addressed. It has had no voice. Mm-hmm. And that's then that's that's a great way to not to, if you don't want people to heal, that's a good way to do it is to not give them a voice and to not give them a way to say, Hey, this doesn't work for us. We really need something different. Mm-hmm. How can we put, how can we be part of this solution? Yeah. Um, doesn't the, the cultural brilliance model though, invite everyone to have the opportunity to have a voice, yes. whether we agree with what's being said or not said, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're at a place now where we're saying, what's on your mind? And then what's the question that we should be asking next? Because you and I both know we've been in organizations, right, where we've asked people what's on their mind. They have told us and they haven't seen anything. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that isn't that what integration's about? Where's the change coming from? Yeah, where's the change coming from? Right. Yeah, I told you all my opinions. I stuck my neck out. I got vulnerable, whatever the case may be, and, and nothing happened. So, yeah, there needs to be actually a commitment to saying we will make changes based on mm-hmm. on what we're on, on this. You know, if it's the if it's our culture in the in the U.S. based on the healing work we're doing, we mm-hmm. will we will make changes. We will work on a design that works for everybody and make some changes. Mm-hmm. And you and you'll see those happen, but it it it's it's a critical. You might as well not do anything if you're not going to mm-hmm. implement the change. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier because this is really true. Um, you've talked about, and these are my words, but what I heard you say essentially is we're having the great divide. You know, husbands and wives are not even watching the same television shows, and I cannot tell you more people whose relationships is have ended over this because they ask the question, who are you going to vote for? I'm telling you, this is very real. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the number one question, a friend of mine said she does all this data. What do you call that data diving? Mm-hmm. Uh, she said the number one question that's being asked now on, on like online dating mm-hmm. is who are you voting for? Mm-hmm. It is the number one game changer and whether or not you're actually going to get somebody mm-hmm. uh, and you want to even meet them for coffee. They're not mm-hmm. asking about what school did you go to or what do you believe in? They're like, who are you voting for? And that is really interesting. <laughs> it, it's fascinating on a couple of different levels. One is that normally we, we don't ask people that question, right? Because it's our right to vote and not tell anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and secondly, um, it's, it's such a litmus test of what this election means to people, right? Mm-hmm. And what camps you're in and the level of divisiveness uh, that... You know, actually, my uh, one of my kids who's in 10th grade just last night at dinner was saying, you know, people in high school, people are asking who, well, they can't vote, most of them, right? But if you could vote, right, who would you, who would you be for? Who would you be voting Mm for? Yeah. And and she said, you know, it's actually hard to talk to kids who are going to be voting for the candidate that's different than the one I I would vote for if I could. And I thought, wow, these are 15 and 16 year olds. And that that the level of divisiveness that if you don't agree with me, then, you know, I don't even know if I want to talk to you <laughs> is really and she's only one snapshot, of course, but it right. is, re- is really, really interesting or that online dating that that's the question. Like, I'm going to decide everything there is to know about you as a human being based on the candidate you're voting for. That should <laughs> give us that should really give us pause. It does give us pause, but yeah. it's a question that never really has meant as much as it does to be alive right now. Yeah. And, you know, the, the question is really being asked by women. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I, that's the most I could get out of her about, about her polling. Or it's not polling, it's data, data analysis. She said it's a question that women are asking. Men, not so much. Uh, but women are asking. And what she's saying to me, let's get back to your authenticity model. What she's saying to me is that the men are saying they're voting for a candidate that they're not actually voting for, thinking that's what the woman wants to hear. And it's really a fascinating uh, dance that's going on. And authenticity authenticity is out the door. Let's take a short break. Yeah, Yeah, let's take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about brilliance, cultural brilliance in the United States. What does the blueprint look like? We'll be right back. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our real house to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on the Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at the drpatshow.com. 
Sky Siegel co-hosts one of today's most popular psychic shows, Angels and Answers, with Artie Hoffman as she communicates healing messages from the spirit world. These messages can be astounding, enlightening, and life-changing. Born with the God-given talent of inner guidance and the amazing ability to heal, Sky has healed thousands of people. Schedule a reading with Sky now. Call 908-500-1474 and visit skyofangels.com. Get into it for 2016. Do you want more prosperity, clarity, energy, and balance in your life? Join Lynn Brown now for one of her amazing workshops, each focusing on a key part of living your best life. For more information and to register for one of these amazing workshops, visit lynnbrownevent.com. That's lynnbrownevent.com. And get into it this 2016 with Lynn Brown. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence, and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com. How would you like increased health and vitality? How would you like to avoid the onset of disease as well as slow the aging process? This is all possible through a simple, safe, and natural process. Every day we are either moving toward wellness or away from wellness. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. I'd like to be your partner in achieving optimal health. Contact me now at MaryJaneMack.com or call 425-392-0659. Visit MaryJaneMack.com. Is traditional medicine not working for you? Do you still feel as if your health isn't 100%? Here at the Holistic Medical Center, Dr. Nushin Darvish and the qualified staff look through the dimensions of wellness and start a healing plan prioritized to your needs. Our physicians assess the whole you until complete health is achieved. Get the help you need by visiting drdarvish.com or call 425-451-0404. Wow. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Claudette, what a show, right? Yeah. Oh, please take a moment to give out your information, and then we're going we're gonna to jump into cultural brilliance in the U.S. Oh, thanks. Um, my website is culturalbrilliance.com, and uh, I also have a very short, thought-provoking uh, newsletter that comes out, email that comes out on Mondays called Leadership Mindset. And on my website, you'll find information about uh, con- or consulting I do in organizations around culture, uh, team development, executive coaching, and uh, keynote speaking. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So we've talked about authenticity in the U.S. We've talked about design in the U.S. and talked about integration. How do we bring this all together? What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that, you know, when we, as a, as a collective, right, as a company, our country, mm-hmm. excuse me, as a country, United States, <laughs> um, starting to look at and understand what a brilliant culture would look like for us. Mm-hmm. You know, and my, my dream and vision would be that we would somehow find a way uh, and would be, I'm not sure exactly how, because we have so many, such a huge population, but where we'd, we'd, we'd get people from every every culture, subculture, walk of life, background, perspective, to be able to come together and really give voice to what their challenges are, what's working really well, what they value about our culture, what they think is you know outdated and dragging us down, what might be toxic or divisive, whatever the case may be. What would be the vision right, for our, a brilliant culture in our country? Mm. And, and, and wouldn't that be an amazing, an amazing conversation? And I think for it to work, you'd have to drop the politics. Mm. You'd have to drop the lobbying to get what you want. It'd be much more around, okay, what's authentic for us? What's true for us? What's our experience? You know, everyone sharing that and really coming from the mindset and perspective that 
once we knew all that, then we could actually start to see what changes we wanted to the design piece, right? What changes we'd want to make. How could we be intentional and conscious about a design and then how would we move to implement it or integrate it? Mm. But the, the key piece to it, I think, well, there are many key pieces, but one of the key pieces would be we'd have to drop the politics. We'd have to drop the part of our culture that has us lobby for our own interests versus thinking about what might be best for everyone. Mm-hmm. Which is not, it, sorry, was, sometimes when I say that, people think I mean socialism or something. And that, I'm not, no, 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 that's right. Not at all. I'm talking about a much higher level where we say, what might be best for everyone? And right. okay, so, if, you know, we can keep this, we can keep that, this is working well. Uh, and what are the things we really, you know, we need to let go of, because truthfully, it's not actually, they're not actually helping anybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we're talking about this, we're going to need to do a lot of this as we move forward. Do you think in the U.S. we're going to be ready for this, you know, or are we going to need another crisis here to bring us together again? That's such a great, great question. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are some people who are so ready for this kind of a conversation. Yeah. And I think there are some people who are um, not yet seeing the value of it, mm -hmm. not yet seeing the importance of it, and are more stuck in um, a mindset of, I would say maybe blaming. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the word is, but of saying, you know what, if all of you change, then I'll feel better. Mm -hmm. And it's all yeah. of us that are the change. All of us coming forward mm -hmm. are, are actually the change. So, so I would hope some different kind of dialogue could happen before another crisis. Well, we do need a dialogue. I mean, we do, we do need to be able to have a dialogue and move beyond, you know, the hate. Um, you, you know, move beyond the cyberbullying. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know what our children think about that right now. Um, you know, we act as if our children don't follow Twitter or don't follow Facebook or don't follow Instagram. But I, 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 am, I am just struck by what the influence of all of that might be for years to come. Now, clearly, we know what the influence of 9-11 was in years to come. But I wonder about what the influence uh, of what's been happening here um, might have on, on this generation uh, of, of young adults or even younger than that. I, yeah, that's a, that's a great question itself. And I think some of it could be it could be positive in the sense that it could be that generation could look at this, look at what's going on and say, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. This just isn't working. And mm -hmm. we need to do something positive. We need to do something life affirming and generative that causes, you know, po that causes positive change to actually occur. Mm -hmm. And this, this reminds me of something I've heard, you know, heard for, I'm sure many of us have heard for de literally decades, which is, you know, we actually all, we know how to heal world hunger. We know how to solve that problem. Yeah, right? we have food that goes to waste, all, you know, by the billions of gallons every year while countries are starving. We could do that. But what's what is that? What stops us is the, it's the politics. It's the mm -hmm. politics that stop us. And I use that word really loosely. But being concerned about what well, if I give you this, what am I getting back as opposed to let's all come together. Let's have the mindset and collective consciousness mm -hmm. to come together. And just put a solution in place. Yeah. And, and you know. The latest film that's out, and I think Leonardo DiCaprio is in, it talks about what we can do, you know, to stop what's happening with climate. But mm -hmm. the first thing we have to do is get everybody on page to, to get an understanding that the climate is changing and it is affecting us. We can't even come to the table and agree on that. We need more evidence, I guess. That's why I'm saying, you know, there may be in, in, our, in our life, maybe in my life, maybe not, a disaster that we can't overturn. Right. And I think that's what you're seeing with the people that are looking at, you know, the world or climate, the globe. They're looking at this may be it. Can mm -hmm. we come together? And I agree with you. I think your message today is that we can and there's a way to do it. We absolutely can if we decide to. And we, we, we literally raise our level of consciousness about this and start looking at things differently from a different perspective versus being so rooted in our own beliefs mm -hmm. about what we think is right or how the world should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. What a show. Thank you for today. I have one last thing. What's your personal message? What would you like to leave us with today? Mm -hmm. Thank you. My personal message is be open 
to differences. Mm. Don't look at difference as differences as something bad. Look at them as learning opportunities. If someone is different than you, what can you learn about them? What can you teach them about you? Because really, we're all human. And as a client of mine years ago once said to me, he said, you know, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there aren't some people that just like jump into them and they have their pants on. Uh-huh. And it's, it's such a humanizing statement. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. Yeah. We're all people and understand and learn about each other's differences. We're really, really not that different. Not at all. Wow. Not Thank all. you for a great show. Uh, go to the website, culturalbrilliance.com. Get a hold of Claudette. Sign up for the newsletter. Uh, much more to come. Now, you've got a great show coming next week, uh, next time. Why don't you tell folks about what your next show is going to be about? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be interviewing um, a cultural brilliance associate named Julie Wilson, who is an expert in uh, leading change, management change, and change, managing change, and really understanding how people and organizations change and why. So it's going to be a really fascinating conversation, and I'm looking forward to that. Also, uh, let's everybody have a great, great day. Have a fabulous weekend, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to the hit show, Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. You can download this podcast and find out more about Claudette and her breakthrough work at ClaudetteRowley.com. Please contact Claudette and find out how you can create a brilliant culture. 